Welcome, and thank you for joining the Boston University Institute for Sustainable Energy for today's Energy of the Future webinar entitled Sustainable African Electricity Sector Expansion, the Critical Role of Social Factors. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ISE's website and on the YouTube channel. I'm Richard Stubbe, an affiliated faculty member of the ISE via my role as lecturer in the Strategy and Innovation Department at the Questrom School of Business at BU, and I'll be moderating today's event. We'd like to thank the Northeast Clean Energy Council for supporting our entire series and welcome their members today, and also thank Homer Energy, a leader in distributed generation and microgrid modeling for co-sponsoring today's event. We're also pleased to collaborate with a number of BU partners, including the Questrom School of Business, where I'm teaching, the African Studi Studies Center, one of the US's oldest leaders in promoting African language and area studies since its founding in 1953, with federal funding as a Title VI National Resource Center, the Global Development Policy Center, who's also doing work in that space, and that, that includes renewable energy financing in Southern Africa, and the student-led Energy and Sustainability Club. Our thanks go out to all these collaborators. Today's webinar has been organized by the Institute for Sustainable Energy here at Boston University. As a quick introduction, the ISE is an interdisciplinary university-wide center dedicating to advancing the energy and water systems of the future. Through its research, the ISC helps business leaders, energy providers, financial markets, and policymakers to, demand, to develop and implement equitable and effective sustainability strategies. All of the ISE's research is available on its website, which is bu.edu slash ISE. Before launching into a discussion about the research that is the subject of today's webinar, I'd first like to introduce my two academic colleagues on this panel, Justin Wren and Elise Harrington. Like me, an affiliated faculty member of the ISE, Justin Wren is an associate professor of operations and technology management at the Western Book School of Business, where his research and teaching interests include clean energy and supply chain management. He was also a visiting professor at MIT's Sloan School of Management and the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge. In addition to publishing regularly in top tier academic journals, Justin was the co-editor and author of the book, Melting the Ice, Lessons from China and the West in the transition to, from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles, which is also available on the ISC website. Justin and I are co-authors of the working paper on which today's webinar is based, and we will be jointly presenting our initial findings. Justin received his MS and PhD in Operations and Information Management from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. After Justin and I present our paper, Elise Harrington will serve as a discussant. Elise is an assistant professor in the science, technology, and environmental policy area at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. She has worked on research projects in Kenya, India, and the United States. Her most recent work in Kenya examined the role of intermediaries in off-grid solar with an emphasis on trust and consumer education. So she is well qualified to offer her independent perspectives on the work that Justin and I are presenting today. Elise holds a PhD in environmental policy and planning from MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning, which if my MIT nomenclature uh, is correct, I believe that's course one. After Justin and I present our paper and discuss our findings with Elise, we'll then open it up for audience questions. All along the way, if you do have questions, please submit them via the chat box so that I can pose them to the panel uh, at the end. So uh, let's get started. And hopefully everyone sees the beginning here. So this is a discussion of how the electric sector in, in, in Africa should expand uh, in the coming decades uh, to, in order to achieve uh, economic growth and sustainability at the same time. Um, this is motivated by uh, the, the massive challenge that in Africa faces, of all the challenges that, massive, that Africa faces, arguably the most daunting is the lack of electricity access uh, all across the continent. Less than half of the more than 1.2 billion people in Africa uh, have access to reliable supplies of electricity. Since electricity is the foundation of, of almost all aspects of economic development, 
it's hard to see Africa realizing its full potential unless and until electricity is much more abundantly available. This is one of the many findings from a report we released a year ago, stemming from research we undertook on behalf of the Bloomberg Philanthropies. As with all of ISE's research, this report's available at the ISE website. I encourage you to download it and review it as it distills into one document a, in a great deal of other research about Africa and its electricity issues. In addition to approximately quantifying the capital gap to make energy access universal across Africa and stressing that incremental expansion of electricity should be supplied by zero carbon re renewable energy resources if global sustainability is to be achieved. The report paid a lot of attention to how electricity should be delivered across Africa. We concluded that there was no one size fits, fits all answer for how best to electrify Africa and that different approaches would be optimal for different regions in Africa. And that over time, this mix of solutions would eventually integrate into a grid of grids. Moreover, we believe that success depended as much as anything else on social factors, good in-country partners and data as the basis for effective interventions and good governance and strong norms that guided the way the region, that the region worked. These speculations on the future of electricity delivery in Africa served as the catalyst for the work that Justin and I are presenting today. Over the past decade or two, advancements in distributed energy resources, or DER, have slowly but surely changed the fundamental economics of electricity service, where customers will use relatively little electricity and where customers are located in sparsely located areas. DER-based electricity approaches especially various forms of locally self-reliant microgrids, often powered by solar, are more cost-effective and less, in, less risky for introducing electricity service than expanding currently weak transmission grids and building new large centralized power plants. In Africa, this combination of low per capita electricity usage and low population density applies to most of the continent, thus implying a large opportunity for DER. And assuming further cost declines with continued technology advancements, the advantages of DER will only, only deepen in extent and widen in breadth. DER's advantages will be especially pronounced where electricity access is currently low, because in these locations, there's inevitably little but pre-existing electricity infrastructure to build upon. While about half of the African population as a whole has electricity access, there are more than a dozen countries in Africa where electricity access is less than 25%. In countries where access rates are that low, it's difficult to envision large scale electricity expansion projects succeeding as there are many factors working in, against investments of that magnitude. At the root of the, many of these factors is the fact that much of Africa is beset by weak governance, corruption and conflict. These factors introduce a wide variety of risks that are very difficult for capital providers to hedge, consequently making massive electricity projects with billion dollar price tags and prolonged construction periods unattractive. But a simplistic posture of just say no to investing in African electricity infrastructure is unacceptable. And with the improving economics of DER, increasingly unnecessary. Using system dynamics principles, we arrived at a conceptual framework that describes the processes by which expansion of the electricity sector can, or might be prevented from, expanding. Here, I'll turn it over to Justin to introduce and explain the model, which then led to the identification of what we're calling the electricity access index to indicate what types of electricity infrastructure will and won't be suitable for a given geographic location. Justin? Sure, well, thank you, Richard, and uh, pleasure to be here. Um, like Richard said, uh, uh, you know, Africa has its unique continent in terms of uh, its uh, heterogeneity in social conditions, in governance, and uh, in, in access to electricity. So how do we look at from the theoretical perspective? And uh, here is the uh, framework Richard and I uh, came up with. And uh, uh, I, th I think the best way to Look at this is you know look at uh, decompose a little bit so uh, if you Richard uh, yeah go to the it, let's first take a look um, 
in our, um, say, society, uh, uh, how demand and supply works in the context of electricity. You know, you first have a, a certain uh, demand. Uh, that's the lower right corner, right? And then, you know, we, uh, you, you know, let's say there is a company that would like to provide some electricity and there's some supply. And uh, the, the company, of course, want to be sustainable financially would uh, say, okay, well, here's a price. And uh, if you are happy, you know, you know, I will install the, uh, uh, the access uh, uh, and then you can uh, con consume the electricity. And of course, the pricing is what we agreed upon. Now, if the customer is happy and it, you know, say the price is reasonable, he or she or they, the household, would uh, consume more and uh, further stimulate the demand, uh, stimulate demand. And uh, uh, this can be uh, uh, a, uh, a uh, self-sustaining uh, loop. You know, in, in other words, when demand is strong and uh, the, the supplier is encouraged to, say, in increase uh, a, a little bit price, and uh, uh, and then with as we saw today, when the uh, when the price increased a little bit, it uh, served as a moderator, then uh, uh, regulate the demand a little bit. So this is what we call the you know the great uh, invisible hand. It works most of the time, although all the, all, the, all the, always as we uh, saw uh, recently in Texas. But most of the time, it is how it works, right? However, um, we point out that this is kind of based on. Uh, this whole mechanism is working on a well-governed uh, a uh, society. And uh, uh, Richard, if you look, go go to the uh, next slide. And it it has a lot of assumptions that uh, uh, that is uh, uh, behind the the mechanism that we just described, right? So first of all, you need to have a good, reasonably good capital markets, right? You know, the capital markets working both consumer side and uh, uh, the supplier side. You know, uh, with good capital markets, you can fund the infrastructure building infrastructure. Uh, and with good markets, you can stimulate customer uh, credit, customer demand. And uh, uh, let's think, of, think about the other way. If there is, in a society, there's no credit market, no capital markets, right? And say, let's say everything, uh, uh, is, uh, is say based on cash or, uh, you know, actually that's the situation we observe in some of the African countries right now. So neither side, the demand and supply side is, uh, is willing to work uh, together to, to make access possible, right? So um, uh, this is one big set of uh, uh, underlying uh, mechanism, which we call the fuel, right? If we use the, uh, uh, the, the automotive uh, uh, analogy. Okay, so uh, next slide. So if we uh, put them together, then what we are essentially saying is that uh, we, we call, there's a big blob of what we call social fabric. Uh, in, in, in sociology terms, it's actually a social institution. Now, it uh, incorporates uh, governance, it incorporates um, access, basic access to education, healthcare, and uh, uh, essentially norm and culture. You know, uh, you know, it, we are in a culture where you know we tend to, uh, you know, base a uh, lot of transactions based on trust, but uh, not so in some other uh, places, right? And uh, the norms is that uh, we sign a contract, and uh, again, it's in, most of the time in good faith, right? And then we execute based on the contract. Most of the contract, you know, uh, actually uh, don't end up in court. But you can easily imagine if a, you, are, you have a very different culture and the norm, and uh, you could say, well, um, well, I signed a contract, but I really don't trust you. And, uh, you know, why should I uh, provide you with this without, uh, you know, some, uh, say, a, a large uh, collateral? So all these are what we call social fabric. And it's... Uh, it really permeates with all corners of our framework. Um, next slide. Now, on top of it, though, it, what's unique in Africa, we think, is that uh, there are lots, lots of uh, risk factors, you know, and uh, we pointed out because, well, frankly, those, those risks exist everywhere in 
uh, more pronounced in Africa. You know, uh, say for example, uh, we just talk about the credit risk. You know, and uh, uh, Africa as a whole, there are some countries that are really uh, very uh, developed. Say South Africa, uh, Egypt, but uh, over and large capital markets are less developed in Africa. That means that there's a lot of credit risk. There are currency risk. There are uh, macroeconomic risks, right? And uh, uh, say inflation, um, all those are playing into, um, I'm looking at uh, the, the currency risk in the middle. You, you can see that it, uh, it really affects capital markets as well as consumer, as well as the, uh, the, the supply side, electricity infrastructure and operations. And particularly, and now I'm looking at a little bit uh, the box right below social fabric. If you look at Africa, uh, uh, Richard earlier showed uh, this, uh, uh, I believe, two uh, maps, you know, showing there are uh, very degrees of conflicts, most of them actually in Africa. And uh, as we all know, a lot of countries suffer from uh, corruption and uh, what we call opaque uh, governance. You know, there's a lot of under the table uh, transactions and deals being done. And uh, uh, what we call those are uh, pathologies and that are uh, hindering the well-functioning of a uh, system in providing access, right? Now, I already mentioned the regu regulatory risk. And in Africa, I want to say one more thing and we can move on. Well, actually two more things. Um, Population risk is actually very, very serious in, in Africa, right? And uh, uh, I'm sure some of you already know, but uh, let's say Nigeria, uh, some, some are, are describing as a, a ticking uh, time bomb. You know, if you look at the, the population uh, trajectory, it is very frightening. And it plays into, well, if we have sudden explosion, explosion of a population in a certain area, and it will affect uh, social fabric, uh, it would affect consumer wealth. And uh, ultimately, it uh, would, uh, uh, we have to ask what's the best mode of providing basic electricity access to uh, those uh, population, right? And lastly, you know, uh, again, we don't see a lot uh, in here and the, uh, uh, many places as well, but in Africa, uh, you know, willingness to pay, unwillingness to pay, uh, theft, electricity theft, and uh, again, uh, related to the normal culture, people just don't think you know uh, you should pay what you uh, what you use, and those kind of things we see uh, uh, more often uh, in Africa. So, at the end, now uh, I, I probably should pause a little bit. You know, your your head probably are are, are exploding. Wow, there's so many things. Indeed, um, there are a lot of things, and uh, uh, but uh, keep mind our goal, and uh, uh, Richard, if you can uh, show the next slide. Um, do we have the slide with the, with the big arrow, uh, the, uh, our, uh, the point of this uh, exercise is to say, oh, thank you, yes, this is what I'm looking for, is ultimately one, we want derive from this theory, theoretical framework into something tangible, into something measurable, into something that can guide practitioners and uh, researchers to say, well, we feel like this is a place where we should provide uh, DER, distributed energy resources. Whereas in other places we feel we can say, well, based on uh, this certain uh, set of metrics, maybe a large scale grids are actually uh, sensible, or maybe uh, it's a mixture of both. So, uh, our attempt here is to say, well, based on this, uh, we, uh, the fact that we have identified a set of uh, social factors, as well as risk, uh, I, let me change my words, uh, so, uh, social uh, uh, drivers uh, and um, um, risk factors, because I, I like to distinguish these two. We want to combine these two sets of things into a what we call electricity access index. Now, uh, to briefly describe how it works, and I'll switch to examples uh, very quickly. And it's essentially um, the driving forces are the big uh, 
oval uh, circles that you saw, right? You know, consumer welfare, capital markets, and uh, uh, infrastructure and operations, those things we call uh, driving forces, you know, index I. And the risk factors, like, you know, the theft, the environmental factor, the, the, the population risk, the supply chain risk, we call risk factors J, right? And what we do is systematically um, uh, categorize them and uh, uh, weigh them by those, uh, by those uh, relatively importance. Now, uh, you know, this is probably too abstract. Let's uh, go move forward and uh, see how we can come up with an example here. So if you look at uh, this uh, uh, hypothetical, actually, uh, I'm, we, we're going to talk about uh, uh, how actually on the ground, how to implement that. But this is, example is, is hypothetical. So first of all, if, uh, if you look at uh, the, the column on the left here, there is infrastructure operation, capital markets, consumer wealth, and like pricing. If we give a relative weights to the four uh, driving forces, let's just say 20, 30, 30, uh, 20, 30, okay, add up to 100%, okay? So those are what we think uh, broadly are the four uh, driving forces in terms of uh, electricity access. Then we could actually measure, you know, say in a particular country or geographic locale, we say, well, what are the risks are there in terms of uh, providing infrastructure and operations? And then we can go down, you know, I'm looking at the third column now, no, no, it, there could be uh, project risk, supply chain risk, environmental, uh, there could be uh, sabotage extortion, I mentioned a little bit, there could be uh, a very weak legal and regulatory system, and therefore um, we give them a, a very low uh, rating, and there could be, you know, currency risk, uh, as well. And uh, uh, looking at the fourth column, you know, this is the relatively, uh, the, the relative measurement, right? If it is uh, a, a perfect 100%, it, we think it is no risk at all, where if it is a zero, it is considered very, very risky, extremely risky, very high risk. So between zero and uh, 100%, we measure those risks, you know, uh, and again, hypothetically speaking, you know, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and so forth, so on and so forth. And now what we do, if you go to the last column, is basically multiply those weights with the risks and with, uh, finally, with the, uh, uh, the overall category risk. Now, in other words, it's a nothing but a, weighted average, okay? Now, the, of course, the most difficult part is determining the appropriate weights and actually measure uh, on a zero to a one scale of how risky is it for each, uh, each risk factors. So now, now in here, as I mentioned, that uh, zero is high risk and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and one being no risk. So here um, in this uh, location, we came up with 0 0.38. Now, in contrast, uh, Richard, if you go to the next one, it's the, exactly the same uh, metric, actually the same weights, you know. Uh, what's different uh, is that, uh, you know, in another hypothetical uh, area where there's a lot of conflicts, you know, for example, if you look at sabotage extortion and uh, there, um, um, it's one, it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very safe compared to, uh, compared to the other, uh, the previous slides, uh, you, uh, you, you rarely see anything above, uh, say, 50%. So at the end of the day, for this particular location, it come up with, uh, you know, almost uh, 90%, 89. Now, you might be wondering, okay, all right, if I buy this framework, you know, assuming that uh, the weights are okay, assuming you did a good job in, in measuring the relative risk of each uh, factors. Um, and how do I use this uh, uh, EAI? And uh, I'll let Richard uh, uh, talk more in detail, but basically what we think it is 
can be used in guiding uh, what we think is the right mode or right mixture of uh, uh, providing infrastructure. Um, and uh, here, Richard um, uh, will talk more about implication. And of course, we'll talk about uh, what we want to do uh, based on what we have so far. Thanks, Justin. So um, as Justin described in those two examples, we've come up with an EAI measure or a scale that ranges from zero to one. And we envision that this scale would be developed or developable for a particular geographic region that could be relatively narrowly defined to a village. It could be relatively broadly defined as an entire country, but it's, it's done in the context of a particular geographic region. And whatever the resulting EAI number turns out to be gives essentially, especially the capital community, the, the finance world, some measure of, based on the, uh, the, the risks and the effectiveness of the system dynamics in, in, in fostering uh, sustainable growth um, in that particular region, what kinds of electricity infrastructure will and won't make sense to, uh, to, to support financially? So when in a, in a region or a geographic locale with a very low near zero electricity access index, the implication of that is that uh, you will want to avoid making long-term commitments uh, in, in assets that are immovable. Um, you will want to avoid working uh, with and through government parties. You will want to um, uh, instead uh, interact only with very selective counterparties that you can um, have very good assurances that they will be credit worthy. So what that means is you'll be wanting to invest in assets only that are very uh, customer specific that don't have any common uh, uh, grid architecture. And so you're talking about Pico systems or solar home systems that don't have any grid whatsoever. Um, just individually electrified appliances and or buildings that, uh, that rely uh, on no other counterparties in, in, in the region. Uh, to the other extreme, a, an EAI of one means pretty much anything should be fair game. A, an opportunity to invest in a uh, 500 megawatt solar farm with a 250 mile transmission line to get the, the electricity from the solar farm to uh, the national transmission grid to the major urban uh, load centers for the country. That if the, if the project is, is structured appropriately and the financial returns look good, that should be a project that should get very good consideration by the capital community. So where the, where the EAI will, will be interesting to, uh, to evolve and to investigate with some real world data is, okay, wh what about in between numbers? Where, where does electricity become you know, from coming uh, from the top down when, when do you stop looking at large scale uh, centralized power plants and large scale transmission projects and look mostly at, at, at microgrids because you, you, the risk is so profound that you do not want to be um, investing in large assets that will take a long time to construct. And um, you know, in, the, in the case of a, uh, of a coup or of, of some sort of economic calamity, uh, the returns on your investment will, will go to zero. So wh where does the electricity access index start pointing the investment community to microgrids and mini grids? And at below which point do you stop even considering those and, 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 and restricting oneself to solar home systems entirely? So the, the, the goal of this, access, this index is to be used primarily for financial uh, uh, for financing, improving the, the risk assessment and in, increasing the financeability of infrastructure investments in risky environments like Africa. But it's also meant to be used by policymakers and thought leaders uh, who want to try and identify which risks and which uh, elements of a society or an economic structure are most getting in the way of, of uh, infrastructure development. The framework and the, 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 the two examples that, that Justin walked through should kind of illustrate that 
what one can do with a bunch of sensitivity analysis and investigate which things are more or less influential in a given region to improve uh, the EAI. And so that would then, as a result, focus any future uh, philanthropic or uh, 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 consultative support to uh, governments and, and stakeholders in a, in a particular region so that the EAI can be improved so that more assets can be invested and that more bigger assets can be invested in. So uh, this is the theoretical construct, uh, the construct that we developed, uh, starting with the, with that overall that complex uh, multi-bubble framework with all the risks overlaid in it. Uh, we wanted to to take into a holistic account all the factors that drive the growth or inhibit the growth of uh, an electricity system in a particular region, and from that really complex set of considerations result in a, a simplistic uh, metric that could hopefully be used by um, uh, both the both capital markets and policymakers in improving the financeability of assets in Africa. So with that, uh, just to conclude our, our, our talk today before getting into open discussion, again, uh, we think there's no one size fits all solution for Africa. There's gonna be a variety of different modes of electrifying Africa that are more optimal in different regions than others. Um, we do think that DER based microgrids uh, are uh, a very promising approach, particularly in rural and remote areas where the social fabric is weak. However, if it gets too weak, then you're, you're looking at solar home systems and PICO systems as uh, being probably the most appropriate, most frequently appropriate electrification approach. Um, the electrification strategy of a particular region should evolve as the social and economic conditions evolve in that region. And our, in our EAI uh, framework or, or metric uh, accommodates that. Uh, the, the, the structure or the approach that we, we've taken to uh, develop that, uh, to develop the EAI is some, such that it, it should be reassessed on an occasional basis for a particular region so that you know, in year 2020, if if the EAI in one region in a region is 0.4, hopefully by 2030 the EAI in that region will be 0.7 or 0.8, and a more and bigger assets uh, can be uh, can be entertained more plausibly in that region. Clearly, as as we've discussed, this is only at the theoretical or conceptual stage at this point. We would like to bring some empirical rigor to this work. Um, the 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 scale needs to be developed. Um, data needs to be collected for uh, trying to uh, calibrate how to, to, uh, to calibrate the zero one ratings on the risk factors, to calibrate the weighting factors, um, both on the driving factors and on the risk factors. And um, from that, try and fit, uh, do some empirical analysis to fit different countries and different regions to AIs and see if the EAI uh, uh, quantifications that we come up with correlate well with the degree of investment activity or lack of investment activity in different regions in different types of electricity infrastructure. Um, that's a lot of work to be done. And so before initiating uh, all of that work, um, we wanted to unveil our uh, conceptual and theoretic approach here today uh, and begin to get feedback on it so that it can be improved before uh, we start undertaking a lot of that uh, pretty extensive um, data gathering and analytic work. So with that, I'd like to reintroduce- uh, Richard, can I, can I say one sure. more thing? Oh, please, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, I think there's a, also, if you're going back, back, this, uh, back one slide, I wanna uh, add that, that uh, this framework is not static. In other words, that uh, the intent of this work framework is not to go to a place, measure it once, provide a recommendation and walk away, right? Um, uh, the, the, the reason is that uh, as we uh, I probably didn't emphasize enough, as any social system goes, it's always evolving. It's always dynamic, right? And uh, I, I hear uh, actually audience ask a very good question. You know, what if you, you, you have a very low score? 
and the, you recommended, uh, you know, Pico system all the way. Is that it? Um, I would say no, uh, because uh, uh, the, it might be appropriate for the time being. However, uh, again, our, our goal is to provide electricity access um, to not only to more people, uh, eventually to all population, but also uh, I'm sure we all know that there's different uh, uh, tiers of electricity access. You know, you not only want to give them a, a little uh, charger battery for charging their phone, eventually you want to give them productive uh, electricity access, you know, enough power uh, to generate, say, for example, uh, uh, machines and uh, uh, com uh, supporting commercial activities. Now, that's why we where we think uh, we want to get this, uh, uh, the jumpstart a local uh, economy. And hopefully uh, uh, with fu our future research, we could eventually uh, get at least getting closer to uh, providing electricity access to uh, more and more people. So, but uh, you know, uh, uh, this is just the one point I wanna make is dynamic. It's always evolving. This framework should not be used as just a, a one shot. So, um, and of course we can talk more uh, uh, after uh, uh, Elise uh, uh, provide his uh, her valuable uh, 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 feedback as well. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'd like to reintroduce Elise Harrington from the University of Minnesota, who's got uh, extensive experience in in looking at electrification in Africa. Um, Elise, perhaps you can start by providing a summary of some of that work, and um, from that, you can jump off into your reactions to our to our uh, conceptual thinking here. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Justin, for inviting me to discuss this work with you today. I'm, um, I'm really pleased to be here. And um, yeah, a lot of my background and work in this really centers on kind of household energy decisions and individual level perceptions of these different electrification options, primarily primarily in Kenya um, and India with a bit of exploratory work in, in Tanzania as well. And so really almost on kind of the, the, other, the other end of the spectrum of kind of the large scale system-wide discussion that we're having here today. And so it's, I think, a really fun opportunity to think about how do you you know start to combine this very individual level perspective with a broad systems level, systems level approach. And I think the systems dynamic approach presented here really demonstrates some of the, the rich complexity that is embedded in rural electrification efforts, um, providing large scale infrastructure access. Um, and within this framework, what, what I think I can speak to kind of most directly is first thinking about you know, the notion of these social factors and how they fit into this broad system, systems level model. And then second, kind of narrow down and think more about this kind of consumer wealth and behavior risks, these individual level risks that fit into this, this overall model. And I tend to focus on really kind of how social relationships inform people's energy decisions and their trust in energy technologies or service providers. And so that focus will probably kind of permeate through the next couple minutes of, of comments. Um, but overall, I think that this work really highlights you know, these critical interdependencies across social, technical, economic, and political factors, and that some of those might be hyper-local and really embedded in kind of relational dynamics. So dynamics about how people interact with one another at a very local level, or might be, you know, much more uh, you know, meso or macro scale. So operating potentially at a regional, national, or even, you know, sometimes these international linkages, especially when you think about something like, you know, the risk in capital markets or something like that. 
And, um, you know, one of the aspects that you, you talk about in your working paper uh, is this notion of polycentric governance. Uh, and I just wanted to also highlight that here because I do think it's an important dimension to think about how some of these risks might operate at different scales, but also, you know, how within a single country or a single region, there are undoubtedly different seats of power that can start to address some of these risks um, and how also there's opportunities for kind of cross-sector collaboration to start um, thinking about how do we mitigate these risks? How can we think, you know, consider investment in under-invested areas because they do have risks that can, might be able to be mitigated through partnerships, um, cro like cross-sector collaboration. So thinking about what might be the role of NGOs here. And one example from some of my experience that I think really resonates, at least with me, with some of how these different risks interact with one another and the broader framework of institutional governance is um, something that's really, really talked about a lot on these PICO levels, so these small scale solar systems, but thinking about um, the notion, um, the development and adoption of quality standards to ensure that, well, when a household is buying a small lantern or a household is buying a solar home system, that that solar system is of high quality and that they know what they're getting and that what they, you know, what they get actually meets what's on that label. Uh, and the trick that I've seen is, or the challenge that I've seen is even once you say, so a country like Kenya um, has a history of adopting these technical standards, um, keeping them quite up to date, uh, but the implementation of these standards is really where you start to impact people's consumer behavior and people's consumer trust. And that requires enough capacity to enforce said standards. So it's not just the presence of governance, you know, a policy, um, but it's also thinking about, well, what's the next stage? Do, can we actually make sure that in those rural markets that people are getting those high quality solar products and that they can trust in that country that, that those products will be of high quality? And so, one of, you know, in the electricity access index that you're developing, I've thought a lot about as I've been reading your work, kind of this balance of the portfolio of risks and how this provides decision makers with this way to think about where these different electricity options might make the most sense. And I think it really does reinforce what, what we're seeing as this increasingly practical view to electricity access, that it is going to require a suite of technologies to meet these electrification goals, um, especially when you think about how that might interact in rural areas, as well as things like informal settlements in urban areas. And conceptually, one of the things that I think might be helpful for thinking about the system dynamics approach and the electricity access index is to disaggregate some of these factors a little bit more and think about those that are political factors and those that might be more relational or really rooted in kind of social and interpersonal and cultural relationships. And so I would almost encourage considering a parallel index to the one that you all have developed, um, one that complements this kind of um, risk and more deficit oriented approach with something that pieces together an index of social assets that supports the adoption of these new technologies that might facilitate or provide pathways for strengthening in, strengthening institutions in rural communities in African countries um, and one of the examples that I often think about this from some of the work that I've done in Kenya is thinking about, well, in a lot of the rural areas that we've done focus groups in, for example, we see a gap often in 
being able to find that electrician who can install a new appliance or who you can really go to to get advice to make sure that you can fix um, something in your elect, you know, with your electricity in your household when you need it. Um, and so rather than solely characterizing that as a risk, for example, to um, capacity to develop uh, rural electrification, can we also think of, well, what regions might have existing vocational schools or training opportunities that could be integrated into this next round of infrastructure development and therefore leveraging some of these existing um, educational assets? Uh, and then thinking about also how we might leverage existing social relationships. So there are other electrification examples for both actually on-grid and off-grid situations where social accountability plays an important role in strategies to think about how we might curb electricity theft or build repayment accountability. And so... Yeah, I'd encourage thinking about not just the risks, but also how we can see assets within the social factors that might mitigate some of these broader risks. And just one more area that I think is important to kind of further consider is thinking more about how risk really aligns with this scale of infrastructure. And so I think the... Um, EI, EAI that you have kind of put together, this framing maps quite well to, to larger infrastructure, thinking about how lower risk allows for this, this durable long-term infrastructure investment while riskier situations might need these smaller, more distributed resources. Um, but kind of thinking about that quality assurance example for um, that I mentioned earlier, and I spent the last few years really focusing on this smaller scale side of, of this kind of infrastructure scale, looking from mini grids to solar home systems to lanterns. Um, and I found, and there's also some other research that supports that you actually really do need some strong institutional capacity for investments at smaller scales as well. And so I think there's room in this framework to, to kind of have more discussion about maybe what kinds of institutional strength, what kinds of policies and programs can support, for example, planning and robust consumer protections that might go along with electrification using these technologies at different scales. And so here I'm really thinking about, you know, what needs to be in place to think about um, protections for bill payment or pricing um, for small scale solar that might be outside of maybe the typical um, regulatory model for electricity pricing? Or how do we think about coordinating and planning the implementation of distributed mini grid systems, how they might interconnect with one another in the future, or eventually might interconnect with a larger grid coming back to, to what you mentioned in the beginning of this discussion of kind of like this grid of grids model, what kind of institutional support does that need um, down the line? Um, and so I think to me, this really reminds, reminds me at least to examine risk in electrification from multiple perspectives. So take this financial perspective of risk and also think about how that might distribute, that risk is distributed in other ways as well. So what kind of consumer risk is going on in this situation as well? Um, and how can we start to kind of piece together multiple perspectives that would inform electrification options? Um, so I will leave it there for now, but this uh, work is, I think, really exciting and generative, clearly. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to talk to talk more about it. Wonderful. Thank you, Elise. Uh, great comments. So many places, so many directions it could go. Um, I think it would be useful to spend a minute or two talking uh, uh, how Justin and I kind of got started on this, and, and because I think it it perhaps explains why um, you know your perspectives are so valuable to us because you're coming at it from the different end of the telescope. When we started this work in uh, 
couple of years ago um, on behalf of Bloomberg to investigate the African electricity sector. You know, in general, the the most of the data and most of the thinking about electrifying Africa was just build more bigger power plants and more dams and put up more transmission lines and blah, blah, blah. And it pretty quickly became apparent that, well, a couple of things became apparent. One is not, not a lot of capital is going to that. And two, the reason is it's really risky. Um, and so three, there has to be a better or different answer. And, you know, uh, not, not that DER and microgrids was a, a, a discovery for me a year or two ago, but what I hadn't appreciated was how much action and activity there already was going on in it. And I, I also was aware of the very sizable amount of activity that's going on with off-grid solutions, solar home systems and ecosystems of various types. But so it struck me that that you know, there was a big, there was a large body of thought and interest in large scale build out in Africa that didn't seem plausible to me in most contexts. Um, it, it seemed like there was a lot of activity going on at the smaller scale, but not enough, but for sure in both cases, not enough capital was going to either. And it, was, it seemed like there was just a lot of, a, a lack of an integrative framework for how capital providers could think about providing capital and, and supporting infrastructure expansion on a continent most of them don't live on and most of them have never been to. And so as a result, they don't really know what they're getting into. And so that got, that got us into thinking about all the various uh, risk factors that may not be well assessed. Now, I, wanna, I really wanna pick up on your comment about perhaps developing a, a parallel index around social assets as 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 we justin and i you know evolved this framework if you look go back and look at the visual um it's a it's essentially a pentagon with a big circle in the middle and the big circle in the middle is the social factors because they the social fabric drives everything or it affects everything so we totally we we came to conclude that that Dom, that dominates so many of the of the driving forces and and is the underlying predicate to all the the emergence of all the different dimensions of risk. So it struck us as the as the core or central thing. Um, and so your idea about uh, a parallel index, um, I, what I interpret that or what I'm I'm thinking on the fly here, what I uh, what I conceive that to be is uh, an index that would simplify that central bubble, uh, if it, as it were, within the within our frankly overall way too complex framework, um, and and maybe in so doing, it 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 if if one could if one could develop a good index about that aspect of the matter, the EAI would be both more robust as a measure and simpler perhaps to describe um, and, and work with. Yeah, I mean, I think, I do think uh, it's a whole, it's a whole project in itself just to think about what is, you know, how do you characterize that central bubble? Um, and I think, yeah, one of the, the areas that I just think it's important to remember is that, you know, yes, social factors pr present in some cases risks, but they can also present um, assets to addressing some of those risks. And so how do you think about not only focusing on um, what might be an, you know, a risk to an investment, but how do you also think about characterizing um, and including in that decision process, well, these are actually really important components that are valuable to making sure that investment is sustainable, to making sure that, you know, that it, it has some of that on the ground capacity or has local support. Um, and that those are some of the elements that I think could fit into that central, um, central bubble and make it really meaningful in terms of a broader a broader perspective on what it might mean to have an investment work 
in some of these in some of these contexts. And so maybe yeah, maybe it's not a separate index, but it's you know um, scoping out something that might fit in to to the index that you've you've um, started developing already. Justin, what are your um, reactions to Elise's comments so far? Oh yeah, I, I uh, thank you, Elise, for the uh, for the very constructive, uh, helpful comments. And I totally agree. And uh, indeed, I think we may have in this presentation kind of uh, highlighted or you know maybe uh, talk a little bit much on the risky side as as opposed to what you mentioned that they're actually uh, positively or reinforcing uh, social. Uh, institutions like uh, you said uh, accountability right and uh, let's say you know reputation you know uh, and there are a lot of research in social uh, social science saying that uh, those unspoken uh, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it, the social fabric you know um, you know the, the the reputation of a village chief right and all those can be uh, very very helpful in terms of um, uh, providing uh, access and uh, uh, make sure uh, the mechanism, uh, whether it's a small grids or a PICO system, can be uh, sustainable. And uh, uh, so I think it's I, actually we should do both. I think you know, capturing the positive ones and of course you know uh, measuring at the same time. Ideally, of course. So yeah. Thank you. A couple of the questions from the audience reference, um, you know, and the obviously very critical role of, um, you know, non-governmental organizations, the multinationals, the, the World Banks, the 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 uh, IFC, USAID, you know, all the alphabet soup of organizations that that work in this space. Um, you know, one of the things that that led us to to start working in this area was a sense that, that while they, um, you know, they probably do have a pretty good handle on these risk factors and, and <clears throat> not only the risk factors, but also kind of the, the variation in the risk factors by geographic area, the, the rest of the capital markets that they try and, in, in, you know, essentially support or attract they exist to basically catalyze other capital providers to come to market. And, you know, the capital just isn't coming to Africa in, in anywhere near the volumes that, that um, is necessary. I mean, in our report from last year, we found that it was probably, the gap was probably at least a trillion dollars over the next 20, 30 years relative to what is currently being dispersed on a on an annual basis, there's probably at least another trillion beyond that that's necessary to to make a real dent. So, how, how it, and 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 you know, I don't think the trillion dollars is going to come from the IFCs and the e, EBRDs and the and the uh, you know African Development Banks of the world. A lot of that's going to have to come from the private sector. So, how can the private sector? How can we attract more capital? for electrification to Africa is really the central motivating factor behind this work. It's really an all, all an effort to make it simpler and or more robust of a method to, um, to attract capital. Any, any thoughts, Elise, on, on, on that aspect of the question? Yeah, and I think it's one of the reasons that your framework can be really helpful is that you highlight lots of, you know, the, the variety of areas that need to be addressed in order to think about what might be considered a less risky, um, you know, financial investment environment. And so one of the things that has really come, you know, that I'm thinking a lot about right now, and I don't have, I think, a full, um, you know, I, it's an evolving thought process, but is thinking about, well, what other institutions, you know, we, we spend at least, and I'll talk mostly about the off-grid solar sector here, because that's what I can, can speak mostly about, but, you know, a lot of the investment um, from both international financial organizations, but also coming in from the private sector is really targeted at service providers. And um, I think my question to the sector is, well, you know, a stable financial environment also requires all of these other factors that you've, you know, included in this 
system dynamics model? And how do we also make sure that, that there's capacity that's thinking about, you know, that's empowering consumers to hold governments and hold providers accountable? What kind of investment needs to be going into that? Is that an area where we might be able to have some of this cross-sector collaborative investment going in in different, in different country contexts? Um, so you might think, uh, you know, I, in, in some rather informal conversations with folks in Kenya, you know, they really raise, well, you know, a lot of these international financial organizations are funding the providers, funding the technology developers, but they're not funding in tandem some of the foundational organizations that might be able to um, provide some of that um, accountability, might be able to, um, you know, act in some of that collective action way to make sure that, you know, there are the supports that go along, I think, with a, a robust and less risky financial environment. So I guess what I would say to thinking about that is, is to take a lot of the factors that you include in this, um, in, in the systems dynamic model very seriously about what needs to be invest, how, how do we need to be investing broadly in the system, not just in, um, you know, solely the providers and technology developers that might, you know, be underpinning this. And so that's one of the areas that I'm thinking a lot about, um, you know, happy to flesh that out more. It's kind of an evolving, an evolving thought process in my mind. Understood. Uh, kind of on a related point, uh, you know, one of the questions, or couple, actually a couple of questions from the audience were in the same vein here on the, on the question of how much rigor and, and how and how practical can, is data collection for this kind of uh, empirical work? Um, is there a way? Is it is it realistic to think about collecting data that would that would allow us to develop robust measures of of the various constructs in this in the AI, or is there inevitably going to have to be a, a significant element of uh, uh, intuition or gut feel about um, you know, what, what the approximate numbers could or should be? Well, I, first of all, you know, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge all the, uh, um, the, uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, um, I feel a little bad, a bit better. I really want them to see their faces and, and have them ask questions so, so we can have a, uh, a, a conversation. Uh, uh, but I just give a shout out to all of you who asked those questions. And those are great questions, and uh, particularly the one uh, Richard just mentioned that uh, uh, you know where do we go from 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 here, and uh, how do we actually do it? And uh, uh, my simplistic answer is, of course, uh, uh, in social science and other uh, discipline, there has uh, there have been multiple uh, you know actually uh, in terms of a research methodology, there are many ways to uh, to go about. Uh, uh, measuring those things. Um, and of course, you, uh, if there's a system uh, in, in place, for example, you need to, you know, come up with scales, and then you need to test it out, you need to, uh, you know, uh, basically say, well, there have you have to acknowledge there are some limitations, like, you know, just think about, uh, you know, how we rank business school, or how we rank universities, you know, there is a component, you know, we ask our peers or experts say, what do you think of this school? And uh, admittedly, yeah, I mean, the, it is subjective, but, uh, you know, ultimately we see that uh, those work are being done and has a lot of credibility. Um, now, of course, devil is in its details. So I would say that, uh, you know, uh, the, the work has just begun and that there's so many things that we need to do in, in terms of coming up with a, a, uh, you know, a convincible and, and credible uh, uh, ground-based results. So uh, I'll just say that much. And uh, uh, I don't know if Elise or Rachel want to add to um, any of this, yeah. Well, I'd like to hear Elise's perspective, um, you know, with given, I've had some experience in the developing world, although not in Africa specifically, I'm just, but my, my exposure would suggest that collecting data, survey data, um, and, and reducing that survey data to 
um, you know, good quantifiable measures of the things that we're trying to get at, the risk factors especially. Um, doable, but not easy. I don't know what your, uh, what your thoughts are. Um, it, it is doable. It is not easy. Um, I do think that some of the, uh, you know, there's a basis to build on here. So if you think about some of the character, characterization of some of the kind of social and political factors, um, you know, the Afrobarometer survey already exists and is a great, great um, basis for thinking about some of what what existing data is out there about, for example, um, political factors that might be able to be um, included. And then, um, you know, I, I think there's ways, and this is maybe where it's another opportunity to think about how data might come, come together with partnerships, where um, at least in, in the off-grid solar sector, and I think also for electricity access in general, um, you know, partnering with utilities, partnering with service providers to get um, opportunities to understand um, existing risks within their portfolio, what really is, um, you know, what are the, the default rates that are currently being experienced, you know, experienced in places. Now that data is incredibly difficult to get. Um, and so I think that there are some real big challenges um, when it comes to data, but there's also opportunities to think about um, what data already exists and how can we build on that um, build on that in the future. And, you know, it, I think it also might mean that some, some measures will be imperfect um, and how do we include that, you know, sense of uncertainty in the ways that this kind of analysis um, is, used in discussions with decision makers, used in discussions with policymakers so that they understand both the opportunities and the uncertainties in, in the existing data. Elise, you mentioned in your, your comments, your reactions to our, our, our talk, um, that you saw merit in, I, I'll, I'll try and paraphrase what I think I heard, in, in kind of separating or segregating political factors from social factors. Say a little bit more about that, and why? Why do you think that's? Uh, for, we kind of see them as two sides of the same coin, and hard and, and really difficult to disentangle. Uh, what What are you What are you seeing that 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 I'm missing? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that they are very related, and um, you're right, really difficult to disentangle. I guess when when I think about them, I think about um, you know some of the um, the factors that, you know, like if you think about corruption, I, I tend to think about that as more of a political factor. And now there are certain maybe social norms or um, expectations that go along with that. But thinking about, you know, what is in the purview of government, what is in the purview of the private sector and understanding some of these um, political and politics variables as um, one category and then understanding the way that, um, you know, culture and um, values that people and communities hold as kind of a separate set of, of factors. And that might be very much a set of social factors that is about how people, um, you know, relate to one another. And you might have a set of factors that's about, for example, trust in government, and that might be more of a political factor, but you also might have a sense of how people trust one another. Um, and how do people build out those um, connections that, that underpin that trust? And I view those more as social factors. And I guess, you know, you know under the umbrella of social factors, maybe one one of the areas that I'm differentiating between is what are relational factors? What is, a, you know, what is about the relationships that people have with one another? And what is about perhaps the relationships that people have with their government, their elected officials, the leaders in the country? Um, and how can, you know, I see those playing out in some ways, um, both in the model that you all have proposed, um, but they might play out a little bit differently. Um, and so that's, I think, some of the differences that I, you know, I guess it's the idea is, is to not mask the variation by calling everything a social factor. 
um, and making sure that you know there's an opportunity to really unpack and discuss some of the differences that might fall under that umbrella. Another word that came up a lot in, in, in your uh, comments, and it certainly has come up a lot in the discussions that Justin and I have had, although we really didn't bring it up too much in today's conversation, is trust and the importance of that. Uh, it's sort of the, it seems like that's the bedrock of both social and political. And um, I, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the, what, what the, the $64,000 question is here, but you know, how, how can one, what, what, what interventions are possible to improve trust in a region so that, you know, all forms of, of economic growth and commerce and investment can occur. I mean, it seems, it seems like that's a central issue here. And yeah, you know, and I agree. And understanding trust and understanding how trust is really a multi-dimensional factor is one of the things that I'm very interested in. And so, um, one of, you know, I think, I think it's, you know, it's complicated. And so I don't have, I think the, the perfect answer to thinking about how do you build that trust to make some, you know, um, to reduce some of these risks, but I will speak to a couple of things that, I think are really important to that that have come through in some of in some of my research, and so I think that um, first of all, people people gain some amount, especially of consumer trust, based on personal experience, and I think that that should not be you know that that needs to be considered in that when you know at least what i've talked with people when it comes to you know why do they trust for example one solar provider over another um there are people who say you know like i don't trust it until i use it until i've used it and i see that it's successful and so that's kind of like a you know a product or service service oriented idea of trust i think there's also this is this is why i think some of you know unpacking some of these relational dimensions of trust is so important because the other areas that I've seen trust really come through are that people, people really do trust those that they know and those that um, might be from their, you know, what they might call their community. And so I did a conjoint analysis, so kind of like a choice model analysis in, in rural Kenya, trying to understand why people might trust different intermediaries um, to help facilitate off-grid solar access. And one of the really influential variables was in that was, you know, is this person from here? Is this person from, you know, my community? And so I think that there is that, that really strong sense of that, but there's also other layers to trust. So in that same, in that same research, um, we found that actually, yeah, people do, people do still, even with you know, corruption and even with complications in the political sector, people do have a strong sense, at least in, in this part of rural Kenya, in, in government. And they want to see government leadership on certain areas. And they expect um, that government will act, although they do expect that the private sector plays a really important role in that as well. And so I think, um, you know, to summarize, I guess, kind of a, a, a long, a long winded answer to your question about trust. I think that that trust is very much um, rooted in experience. Um, trust is built over time and over repeated interactions and people really do trust what and who they know. And I think it's important for us to think about that um, in something like rural electrification. Well, and, and just following up on that, it, you mentioned that you trust is is inextricably tied to people that they know and people from their community is very a very influential trust building variable. Um, but that's not something that, for instance, I can provide or Justin can provide, or or a lot of the people who are active in this space provide can provide. So how how can a how can an outsider, you know? You, you know, presumably well-intentioned and, and, and maybe with, with skills and capacities and capabilities to offer, how can an outsider help expand or build trust if that's so fundamental and foundational to all of these uh, factors? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think for, for me, what that really comes down to is making sure, and I'll, I'll speak for kind of my personal approach as an outsider working in these areas um, to my research is thinking about, well, how do I develop really meaningful local partnerships so that I am working with people who are from that community um, and that it's in service of the goals and um, issues that have been identified by those community members and that, you know, what I can bring as an outsider might be certain perspective, might be research capacity, um, might, you know, you know, often be this complementary perspective to, um, to, you know, a really insider perspective. But how do I have that be the first step to all of my work is thinking about who is my local partner? Um, you know, and there have been some, some critiques, I think, of of Western researchers coming into, um, into you know, the global South as kind of parachute, you know, you come in, you do a project and you leave. And how do we maybe start to really shift that model so that research, just like development projects in general, is rooted in what, you know, yeah, what is trust first and how do we think about who those local organizations are that we need to be working with in order to have some of that trust. So that's my, my take. And, and, and so that, that's a good take. I mean, it make, it's a sensible take, I should say. Um, there's no easy answer, of course, but um, what, uh, what strikes me is that you mentioned, you know, the West model, the Western, the West's model of assistance and support and intervention is you know drop in fly in do work and then leave so it strikes me that's a bit different from what we're seeing now from especially China in terms of their massive in investments in Africa and and more than just capital investments it's financial capital investments it's human capital investments they 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 don't parachute in and and then leave. They they come and stay, and they they're there. Now that's more in the case of large scale infrastructure assets, you know, like big power plants and refineries and mining operations and things like that. I don't know how much China is supporting some of these more developing or de uh, uh, distributed, uh, you know, pico and solar home systems or even microgrids. But I'm, I was just a long preamble to asking. Does do you see that the Chinese that that Chinese model being more effective, and is that something that you know is that something that the West in in our work there should we be should we be thinking more along those lines too? It's a great question, one that I I don't feel you know incredibly equipped to answer, but I'll 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 put, provide a couple of comments that maybe can be built on. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that the, one of the differences that I, for example, might see between some of what I've observed about Chinese investment and Chinese projects is, yeah, well, first of all, the, the Chinese investment, they're large scale, and then in some cases, you know, really addressing critical infrastructure, um, that, you know, roads that are needed, um, and so they're willing to, you know, invest in things that maybe aren't super, um, you know, kind of like hot topics to talk about. Um, but that in some ways what I've seen, you know, and because I, I do think, I do think there is long-term investment and long-term commitment to issues elsewhere coming from other parts of the world. Um, but I think it's very kind of project-based. And I guess that's one of the ways to also think about this kind of like drop-in model is like, um, you know, is the project you're working on six months long and you're just testing out an idea and you're just doing a field experiment and then you're leaving? Um, or is there a longer term strategy for it? Um, and so I guess that's the, the extent that I feel like I can kind of comment on that question. Um, but I think it's, it's certainly worth a lot more thought in how do you compare these models? What are the strengths and weaknesses of both of these investment approaches and where can, um, where can they learn from one another, especially when we're thinking about what might be a long-term, you know, a long-term partnership-based approach to some of these development goals.
On a unrelated question, sort of a follow up. How important is the um, the ownership structure to this in terms of maybe a better way of asking the question is, do, is success highly correlated with local parties being the ones who literally financially own the and, and, and get financially rewarded the success of a project? Um, is, is there, does, does, and if that is true, does that entrepreneurship, does that success breed other success? Is there, a, a, are there a, examples that you're aware of that, that suggest that there's a, um, kind of a virtuous circle or cycle of, of financial and, and activity, investment, and cr wealth creation, spawning new economic activity? Or is it just you know getting a solar light and then that's the, that's the end of the end of the game, end of the road? Um, that's also, I think, a, a question that is still being um, you know played out all the time on the ground with the projects that exist. And I don't know of you know like one definitive example that says you know if we have if we have local ownership over. Um, a mini grid, for example, that will really generate or spark a lot of other economic activity. I think that you could think of theoretically the, the rationale for that. Um, I think you can also think of these other social and political dimensions of local ownership that might also play a role, might think about, well, if you if there is local ownership, um, how might that be strengthened by some of the social accountability that we're talking about? Um, if there's uh, local ownership, might there, or at least local, strong local participation, you know, might that be an opportunity to make sure that the technologies um, that are being deployed, such as home system, well, really maybe more mini grids, but, but across the range are really meeting the needs of the people that they're trying to serve. And can we make sure that that um, kind of loop is, um, you know, a cyclical loop of feedback and engagement and, and participation in the decision-making process. So I'd say kind of the owner, at least my understanding and, um, Justin, if you have if you have more to add, please do. Is that like um, I think it's a really strong theory to continue to probe and test because we certainly see different ownership models in all sort all other countries thinking about rural electrification. So we should be considering similar options um, as we think about development goals elsewhere. Um, but I think there I don't know of a definitive example that says like this. This is the pathway or this isn't the pathway, but that we're still in the process of kind of testing it out um, to see what, what some of the outcomes might be. Justin, I think, if we Justin, I think you're off mute, so go ahead. Uh, you know, I just, again, I want to uh, look at, uh, you know, the uh, uh, audience question that has the many, many good questions in particular. Uh, we actually talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, what, uh, I'm reading uh, one of the latest questions, uh, implications of arrive and stay approach, you know, uh, how does the, I think it's more question towards uh, Elise, you know, uh, you know, uh, arrive and stay approach, you know, what's the implication that on um, the local culture and uh, community, you know, definitely, you know, a very important question, you know, like you said, at least earlier, you know, maybe arrival stay is one of many uh, approaches, and of course, not every method would uh, would uh, would ultimately lead to the desirable goal. But uh, I think this is where you know there's so many. Um, I think it's a good thing that uh, people are trying various ways. In fact, I want to also acknowledge another. Uh, uh, that if I Richard Hansen, that uh, you know, to talk, uh, look at. Uh, uh, point us the link where the you know MIT uh, uh, Energy Initiative people have done uh, actually look at uh, you know uh, you know of course there's a very heavy data driven analysis looking at uh, you know uh, you know a particular work that I know is in India you know you, you combine uh, various sources of data and uh, using optimization technique more more like engineering approach uh, 
to say, well, here's how we should connect, you know, isolated area to small grids and mini grids to larger uh, to larger uh, grids. And of course, I would, uh, you know, quick to point out that, uh, you know, uh, there's huge uh, like social factors we need to uh, incorporate in in such a uh, in such an approach, right? Or it it will it will benefit if we this such an analysis. Uh, look at you know things like trust. You know, um, I would uh, I would end on my my comments actually on on, on the story that I uh, uh, well I, recently I began to read more to read more and more economic history uh, book uh, because I'm interested in how things get started right and uh, I, uh, uh, I first uh, you know I I look at how you know Edison was able to build. Uh, his first power plant in the tiny island called Manhattan <laughs> today. Um, and uh, what struck me, of course, this, I mean, I actually, I think it's, it's a great story, but what struck me is that uh, the social institutions were at that time pretty efficient, right? You know, uh, you know, Edison was able to find essentially venture capital, right? And of course, JP Morgan being one of the, uh, um, uh, uh, of the prominent names. But if you look at uh, what they did, right? The you know uh, uh, the the governance system right uh, the uh, the banking system the capital markets you know every, almost everything we mentioned there you can look at okay you can say oh well in 19th century uh, America the social institutions are pretty uh, pretty darn good in terms of uh, supporting risky ventures you know of course Edison at that time is very very risky right so. Uh, what can we learn from those things and uh, 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 and uh, use them in in, in Africa? And uh, uh, I think there's a lot of things we could uh, we could uh, we should discuss and uh, think about uh, in this context. You know, yeah, just some comments. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. I, uh, go ahead, Elise. I was going to say I agree with with Justin that that really looking at history is a really important component of this. And I think that um, sociologists that look at the kind of early development of, um, you know, Edison and Insul and how the electricity sector developed here really do emphasize the social connections, even on the industry side. So, you know, what we've been talking a lot about is the social, you know, the kind of end user social, social side, but there's also this social side of of the developers and the providers and what net, what social networks do they have that are kind of promoting certain technologies or certain options. And that certainly um, from a sociological perspective was influential in the construction of what we have here today in the US. And similarly thinking about back to the question of investment that was raised earlier, Richard, about thinking about the multiple kind of multiple dimensions of this sector that could be considered in need of investment at this time. We also see from um, work from like Richard Hirsch um, that, you know, the political, the, the regulatory system moves in tandem with the technical system and that, you know, you, you do need to really build um, out those policies and those protections and the regulatory regime in tandem. And so that I think just also uh, fits in with kind of Justin's historical lens on, on this as well. well. Thank you, Elise. Uh, it's always nice to wrap up on a historical note to, to provide some grand context. Uh, we are out of time, um, but I'd like to thank uh, Elise Harrington, uh, as our discussant, I'd like to thank my co-author Justin Wren as well. And then most importantly, I'd like to thank the audience for uh, registering and, 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 and joining us today. Excellent questions uh, that you had for our panelists. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank another round of thanks for our sponsors, uh, the Northeast Clean Energy Council, Homer Energy, and at BU, our, our collaboration partners at the African Studies Center. Global Development Policy Center, Questrom School of Business, and the Energy and Sustainability Club. Please join us for our upcoming ISC Energy of the Future webinars. The next one is on June 18th, entitled Improving Sustainable Investing Through Better ESG Metrics. Uh, that will be held with the leadership of BU's new um, 
impact measurement and allocation program. Uh, so until then, uh, farewell for now uh, and look forward to seeing you at future events. You can register at bu.edu slash ise slash spring 21.